Good afternoon, everybody. My name's Graham Budd. I'm the director of the Faraday Institute for Science and Religion. And a uh, very warm welcome to today's uh, research seminar, whether you're joining us online or in the room here in Cambridge. And um, I am very pleased to welcome this afternoon uh, Dr. Andrew Jackson, uh, who I will introduce in just a moment. But uh, Andrew is going to be speaking to us about the divine logic of evolution, reading evolutionary biology through the lens of Maximus the Confessor's Logoi cosmology. Um, now, I have to admit, this is not a topic that I know a huge amount about, so hugely looking forward to your, your talk. But just let me introduce Andrew um, before we get started. Um, so, after taking an MA in zoology at Oxford University under Richard Dawkins and a PhD in bioengineering at Reading University, Andrew pursued a 30-year 30, 30 career in the development of medical products and technologies, working for a major blue chip company and two of the Cambridge-based engineering consultancies. He then worked for the Faraday Institute as our Director for External Affairs before opting for retur early retirement to study academic theology. He sat at the University of Cambridge Advanced Diploma and MPhil degree in theology, followed by a PhD at the University of Nottingham, entitled The Evolutionary Logoi, a constructive theological engagement of Maximus the Confessor with evolutionary biology and the topic, uh, obviously closely linked to the topic he will be talking about uh, this afternoon. So it's a great pleasure to be back at the Faraday Institute after five years away, I think it's five years. And thank you to the organizers for the opportunity to come back and tell you a bit about what I've been doing over the last five years, only a small amount of what I've been doing. Um, and it's encapsulated in this title, which is actually very close to my recently completed PhD thesis title, The Divine Logic of Evolution, Reading Evolutionary Biology Through the Lens of Maximus the Confessor's Logoi Cosmology. Or it could equally be said, uh, reading Maximus's Logoi Cosmology through the lens of evolutionary biology. So if you're interested in a, um, a written version of this, uh, something very similar to this was published in Zygon in September. So if you check that out, you'll, you'll see a paper on that same subject. <coughs> the aims of my presentation are really fourfold. Um, I need to introduce to you, for those of you not aware, Maximus's Logoi cosmology to start with. Um, but then I want to go on to assess a number of recent claims about that doctrine, about how it resembles evolutionary biology. But in the process of doing that, I hope that also um, I'll be able to illustrate for you the value of patristics as a way of doing science-engaged theology, in particular, Eastern patristics or East, Eastern orthodoxy, which I think it's fair to say has been relatively underrepresented in the field of science-engaged theology, although it's, slight, it's slowly changing, thankfully. Um, and at the end, I want to offer one practical application of my research. <clears throat> there are others, but I don't have time to cover all of them. And one of them is with regard to a recent kind of um, renaissance of interest in the Christian apologetic design argument, and the resurrection of the design inference. Um, a couple of caveats I need to make is, well, first of all, I, I might refer to Eastern tradition quite a lot. And I need to make it clear the Eastern tradition is a very broad tradition, just as the Western tradition is very broad. You know, you have the, the Greek Orthodox, the Russian Orthodox, the Oriental church, and even within those, there's a great variety of opinions. So I'm not claiming to represent them all by any means. Um, another caveat is that this is very much work in progress. Um, so I'm still, in learning mode and I very much welcome all of your, your feedback about how I can improve the argument and if there's any gaps in my argument. So um, at the outset, I think it's important to um, tell you what the genre or the positioning of this work is so that there's no misunderstanding. 
And I would describe it sitting at the intersection between four different fields. So it's, it's a science engaged constructive theology, but it's drawing upon a historical source and also it's drawing upon philosophy or philosophical theology. And I don't think it's um, breaking any new ground, uh, although it's inevitable that I will be choosing some interpretations over others. And it's also important to say that I'm seeking synthesis and dialogue, um, not if, if any of you are aware of the famous Barber, Ian Barber, different modes of discourse. I'm certainly not interested in conflict. So I will be assuming, for example, that uh, evolutionary biology and its ancillary mechanisms, um, uh, sorry, Darwinian uh, natural selection and ancillary mechanisms are the best um, explanation for life today. I'm not going to be entertaining any polemical uh, discourse about that. Um, and I'm not entertaining independence either. So it's, it's really trying to, to have a two-way dialogue. We can learn from ancient sources and, and we can also reread re and interpret ancient sources in the light of modern day science. So who was Maximus the Confessor and why on earth study his work? Um, so Maximus was a very famous uh, Byzantine Christian monk, um, theologian, philosopher around the turn of the sixth, seventh century, uh, martyred for his stance in the monothelite controversy. That's the, the controversy that was raging at the time as to whether Christ had one will or two wills. And unfortunately for Maximus, he, um, he had the temerity to um, go up against the prevailing uh, one will view at the time. And for that, he was uh, tortured by Emperor Constans, had his tongue cut out and his right hand amputated and died of his wounds shortly after um, somewhere off the Black Sea coast, I think he, he was staying in prison. Now Maximus um, represents very much a high point in Eastern thought being a successor to a number of different um, uh, famous theologians and philosophers. So he's heavily influenced by uh, Dionysius, Pseudo Dionysius, Evagrius Ponticus, the Cappadocian church fathers, as well as the Neoplatonists and, and the Cappadocian, uh, I've already said them, the Cappadocian church fathers, ne Neoplatonists. Um, and as a result, um, he's a very good um, sort of interlocutor for a number of issues in philosophy and theology. And there's been a huge renaissance of interest in him over the last 20, 30 years in all sorts of areas. Although strangely enough, not much in the natural sciences and especially not much in, in biology and evolutionary biology. Now he also, as well as uh, his involvement in the monothelite controversy, he's also famous for what he has to say about creation in terms of the logos and the logoi. So I need to now explain to you what that is. So the logos, um, Greek word is very polysemous, had many different meanings, but they all tend to cluster around things like uh, reason, logic, rational principle, definition, argument. And the plural form of the word, uh, logoi or logi if you're a modern Greek speaker, um, refers to the kind of refractions of the logos uh, as individual principles that go out into creation. And it has a very rich philosophical heritage. Um, so Plato's Demiurge created according to a logos paradigm. Uh, the, the Stoics had the famous seminal re, uh, rational principles that constitute the universe and the Neoplatonic Platonic idea of um, procession and return. And then the early church fathers as well um, appropriated this. And they did so not just on the basis of the philosophy, but also on the basis of scripture. So most famously, John chapter one, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. 
in the beginning, he was in the beginning with God and all things were made through him. Without him, nothing has been made. But also in other um, Pauline epistles where you have a lot of prepositional content. So this is often called the prepositional metaphysics of Paul. So I'm referring here to um, passages like Romans 11:36, from him and through him and to him are all things. And Colossians 1:17, Christ is before all things and in him all things hold, hold together. So there is a very clear scriptural rooting of this uh, Logoi principle. But Maximus takes it much, much further. And uh, his motivation for considering the Logoi is really to refute or transform something called originism. This is the, the idea uh, allegedly going back to origin, although maybe distorted from origin, which is that all creatures originally were existing in a kind of serene state, stasis around surrounding God, all equal, uh, but eventually they got bored uh, or they got satiated and they fell away. And as a result of that, God um, clothed them with embodiment. And he did so according to the degree to which they rebelled. So therefore, according to originism, all of creation is a product of sin and rebellion. Now Maximus was saying, no, all of the diversity of creation is not due to sin, it's due to God's goodness, because the, the good logos is in all of creation. He famously refers to this in one passage about the logos becoming thick in three ways, in creation, in the historical incarnation, and in the letters and syllables of scripture itself. He also somewhat paradoxically says that the, the logos is the logoi and the logoi are the logos. So what he seems to be saying is that there's no uh, median terms, unlike the Neoplatonists who saw in between the one and the many, they have life, soul, intellect. Uh, there is nothing, there's, there's no difference between the logos and the logoi. It also preserves the simplicity of God so it's not like saying the Logos is a composite. And also scholars have um, debated, still do debate what the Logoi really are. And I don't want to get too involved in that at this moment, but the four main categories of understanding are either the Logoi are like divine ideas or the Logoi are <coughs> divine wills or they're divine energies or activities or the Logoi are the person of the second person of the Trinity. So why on earth study the Logoi then? So this is my initial motivation. There have been over the last 10 years, several different casual allusions to the Logoi and evolution or the Logoi and genetics. And I'll only share with you a few of them. There are many more than what I'm going to share. So first of all, Christopher Southgate, in his famous book, The Groaning of Creation, in 2008, said the following, the Logoi resemble points and peaks within evolutionary fitness landscapes. Every peak has a possibility imagined in the mind of God, hence possessing divinely given patterns of being. So what he's referring to here is the famous um, uh, fitness landscape originated by Sewell Wright, where you have uh, X and Y are different morphological characteristics and the Z axis is fitness and populations under natural selection tend to migrate towards the optima and get trapped there. Um, so he's saying that the, the logoi are like the peaks of that landscape. Then in 2017, Elizabeth Theokratov, um, Eastern Orthodox scholar, said the Logoi might seem as something like spiritual DNA, the, the code of letters that enables the creature to actualize itself. And then more recently, Mark Chenoweth said, evolution moves forward through various Logoi, fulfilling God's plan for the world. As I said, there are many other quotes where these came from, but despite these casual allusions, there hasn't been to date any sustained attempt at interpreting the Logoi in the light of evolution. 
So that's what my task is, has been. So the summary of the argument is that um, the logoi do indeed resemble uh, or seem eerily resonant and concordant with a number of aspects of evolution. But they also have a number of less concordant or dissonant aspects. And I am going to argue that nevertheless, those can be accommodated within an evolutionary framework, given a proper understanding of the role and the function of the logoi, and given some wider resources from the Eastern Orthodox tradition. So by the end of this, I hope that what will emerge is a th theological understanding of evolution that while is not new or unique, may be said to be distinctively Eastern. I'm going to start by covering four different similarities, which I summarize as the defining logoi, the moving logoi, the temporal logoi, and the entangled logoi. Now, what I'm going to do, I, um, apologies if this might come across a little dry, but I don't think there's any escape from giving you some primary textual evidence for what I'm saying, okay? Um, so I'm going to read out a number of quotations. So the Logoi account for the similarities and differences of creatures. Maximus says, if the many things are different, it must be understood that their Logoi, according to which they essentially exist, are also different, since it is in these, or rather because of these Logoi, that different things differ. Incidentally, the, uh, in brackets at the bottom is the source. So this is referring to the ambigua, the book of difficulties. Um, and there are other sources as well. The logoi also define particulars or individuals as well as universals or species. And this, is a, this will become a very important point. Maximus says, the whole of God is indivisibly present in each particular thing according to the logos through which that thing exists in its own way. God is whole in all things commonly and in each thing, each being particularly. Thirdly, the Logoi are what I would call constitutively imminent. Uh, Maxima says the Logoi exist within beings and create the essences of those beings and preserve them in existence. And in many texts scattered around his corpus, you will find words like the Logoi being implanted, intermingled, engrafted, embedded. So this suggests a meaning of imminence as not just being near or present, like God filling a sponge, as I think Augustine said, but interior or inherent. Finally, the Logoi emanate from the Logos without diminishment. Maximus says, if beings possess perfection by divine foreknowledge, but emerge as imperfect when they enter existence by means of creation, then either they are not that which was foreknown, but something other, or else the difference between the two constitutes a clear weakness on the part of the creator, who was not able to realize fully in creation what he had envisaged in his foreknowledge. I take this to mean that effectively what God intends is exactly what he gets or what he gets is exactly what he intends. There's no declension, there's no thinning out. It's exactly what God is desiring and intending. So how can we summarize all of this? Well, from these texts, it seems to me that Maximus understands creation to be configured and imbued by the Logoi. And depending on one's understanding of what the Logoi are, this means that creation is in some sense divine because whether the Logoi are thought of as ideas, wills, energy, or person, each of the Logoi is itself the Logos. One way of expressing this philosophically is to say that God is the intrinsic formal cause of all things, not just an extrinsic archetype or exemplar, but also imminently present. One way of expressing this scientifically could be to say that the Logos supplies the information content of the world 
the form, the shape, the intelligibility of everything. Now, I know this will raise a lot of questions and concerns, some of which I will come to later. For now, I'm going to label this interpretation of Maximus as a species of panentheism, not pantheism, panentheism. In other words, um, in some sense, the world is in God and God is in the world, with God not orchestrating from a distance, but in union with it and indwelling it. God is incarnate in the world, not just in the historical person of Jesus of Nazareth, but as the cosmic Christ. And therefore it follows that the world ought to be revealing God's presence, which indeed it does, at least to those with the eyes of faith. So you might sum it up by saying that creation is therefore ex Deo as well as ex nihilo. It's from God as well as from nothing. But now I will come on to the next um, synergy between Logoi and evolution, and that is the moving Logoi. And Maximus describes the motion of the Logoi in three ways. First of all, a journey of becoming in three stages. Secondly, a procession and return. And thirdly, an expansion and contraction. In one of his many famous triads, Maximus speaks of the Logoi journeying from an initial state of being to an intermediate state of well-being, and then on to a final end state of eternal well-being. The first movement along the journey is from eternal pre-existence as a, an idea in God to an idea instantiated in a finite mode of existence. The second movement along the journey are the actions taken by creatures to fulfill their purposes and to flourish in well-being. Now, Maximus seems to restrict this to rational creatures, i.e. human beings, who uniquely have the power to change their mode of existence to be more or less in line with their logos. And the third and final movement is the achievement of eternal well-being, which occurs at the point of deification or union with the logos. So the first and third stages in the triad are, you might say, trans-temporal in the sense that they cross over from outside time in, to inside time or inside time to outside time, whereas the middle stage, the logo of well-being, is intra-temporal. The second way of describing movement is procession and return. Maximus says, according to the creative and sustaining procession of the one, to individual beings, the one is many. According to the reverted inductive and providential return of the many to the one, as if to an all-powerful point of origin or the center of a circle pre-containing the beginning of the radii originating from it, insofar as the one gathers everything together, the many are one. So that's quite a mouthful, but it's going back to the Neoplatonic thinking of the one emanating itself into the many and the many collapsing back down into the one. And he borrows from Plotinus, in fact, this image of like a starburst or a wheel with radii, with the, the center of the, uh, the circle being the one and the extremities on the circumference being the many. And, and the biblical basis for this, again, is passages like Romans 11.36, from him and through him and to him are all things. So from him and to him. So here's a diagram that illustrates my interpretation of what Maximus is saying here. On the left, you have the procession, the, the starburst outwards into, from, the many, from the one to the many, occurring as um, the logoi of being and the logoi of well-being. And the circle on the right is the return, the epistrophe, the many are the one, the logoi of eternal well-being. And note how the, the lines are all sort of radially parallel at this stage, okay? Then we have the image of expansion and contraction. Maximus says the substance, usia, of all beings has been set in motion and continues to move according to the principle and mode of expansion and contraction. For it is moved from the most generic genus through the more generic genera 
to particular species through which and in which it is naturally divided, proceeding down to the most specific species where its expansion comes to a limit. And once again, it is gathered back from the most specific kind of species, moving back through more and more general categories until it's gathered up in the most generic genus. Here, Maximus goes further than a simple procession of the many from the one and a return of the many to the one. He add, adds some extra detail whereby the most generic substance subdivides as it expands into ever more specific categories and the process is reversible. Now, Maximus is not entirely clear on how these different kinds of movement are interrelated. And one interpretation by a famous Maximus scholar, Thorstein Tollefsen, is that the triadic journey of the Logos and the Neoplatonic procession return refer to a cosmological and ontological sequence, whereas the expansion and the contraction is more of a conceptual or contemplative movement. My suggestion, suggestion is that we can perhaps combine all three. So I've attempted to do that here by combining the procession and return with the expansion and contraction hierarchically. So you'll see on the left, the expansion from the most generic to the most particular, and on the right, the contraction from the most particular to the most generic. So it's already starting to look a lot like the hierarchical organization of life that results from phylogenetic descent with the branch points closest to the center corresponding to higher taxa such as phyla and classes while the branch <laughs> points furthest away correspond to families and genera and species. It could however be a purely conceptual metaphysical scheme. After all it was possible to classify in this way long before evolution was ever imagined. But what makes this spookily much closer to real evolutionary change is what Maximus has to say about the Logoi and time. Maximus's vision of the Logoi expanding and contracting, processing and reverting is not just an abstract contemplation, it also seems to happen in a temporal fashion. So Maximus says, by his word and in, in his wisdom, he created and continues to create all things, universals as well as particulars, at the appropriate time. And he uses the Greek word chronon. In another place, he says, individual things were created at the appropriate moment in time, and this time he uses the Greek word chiro, in a manner consistent with their logoi, and thus they receive themselves actual existence as beings. The fact that the logoi appear at the appropriate moment in time suggests that we can put a time axis, I would suggest, on the expanding circle diagram that turns the hierarchy from being merely conceptual to being ontological and historical. It also means that since we're dealing with things that happen in time and space, there is possibility for some engagement with natural sciences. So on the left, the procession and expansion, logo of being and well-being happening in time. And on the right, the return and contraction is outside time or beyond time. The resulting picture bears a striking resemblance to circular depictions of the tree of life, as you can see here. Maximus's vision is even attuned to those modern views of evolution which seek to avoid the progr progressivist bias of vertically pointing tree diagrams by replacing them with diagrams that have rotational symmetry. Finally, although the temporal expansion of the logoi from the most generic to the most particular resembles the adaptive radiation of living species as they split and branch from their ancestors, it is on its own a rather one-sided view of evolution that neglects the enormous amount of convergence, cooperation, and coalescence that has occurred along the way. Amazingly, the Confessor's Logoi vision also coincidentally takes account of these more constructive stabilizing forces. In Ambiguum 7, he writes, all created things are positively defined by their own Logoi and by the Logoi that exist around them 
and which constitute their defining limits. One could interpret this to mean that the logoi do not just emanate, divide, and cascade, but they also interact creatively en route. For Maximus, this is the main way God exercises his providence to counteract the intrinsic instability of the cosmos. It's a delegated providence in which the logoi bind things together as wholes to parts in what Tollefstein calls a holomeric harmony of unity and distinction. Scientifically, this providence need not be interpreted merely in terms of genetic relatedness, where unity derived from behavioral cooperation is achieved only between closely related family members, but also can be understood as the complex entanglement of unrelated species that have co-evolved into states of mutual interdependence. So there I have nuanced the diagram by creating a, a bit more complexity, a bit more reticulation in the tree of life rather than just a hierarchical cascade. <clears throat> Oops. So let's return to some of the uh, remarks of the authors I quoted at the beginning, um, which were the motivation for this study. First of all, are the logway really like DNA, as Elizabeth Theocritus says? Well, yes, but only if they are interpreted as the informational coding of the whole universe, not just of the DNA-based pairs of living things. This is because logoi exhaustively define all things, not just living things, and certainly not just DNA or genes. Secondly, does biological evolution really move forward through various logoi, as Mark Chenoweth has claimed? Yes, I think they do indeed, although we must view this movement to be complex and going beyond mere biological evolution, since its completion goes beyond our current space-time. Finally, is Christopher Southgate correct to say that the logoi correspond to peaks on an adaptive landscape? Well, no, not really. And I'll say more about this in the application later. The logoi code for all things, including particulars, not just ideal types. The logoi are an intrinsic formal cause, not just an extrinsic formal cause, which means that Maximus's cosmic vision is much more than a platonic participatory vision. So the interim conclusions are that all things big and small, generic or particular, are fully intended by God and fully indwelt by God. Creation is in evolutionary in the sense that the Logoi are moving hierarchically and interactively from being to eternal well-being. And therefore, according to this scheme, evolution must be fundamentally good since the Logoi are the Logos. Coming now to the, the apparent dissonances, um, and there are three of them I want to cover. The immutable Logoi, the teleological Logoi, and the good logoi. Maximus clearly states in several places that the logoi are unchanging and unchangeable, a fact that has led at least one scholar to claim that Maximus's logoi cosmology is irreconcilable with the ontological transformations entailed in biological evolution. Maximus himself may well have believed in the fixity of species along with probably most of his peers, but that does not mean that the Logoi are intrinsically incompatible with evolutionary change, especially when we understand the reason why Maximus stresses their incorruptibility, that is to say their permanence as divine wills. Maximus says, if the principle of things exists permanently in God, then the purpose of God who created all things must be changeless concerning them, for God's purpose cannot be contained within the boundaries of time nor does it admit of change relative to the changes that take place among the things that are subject to it. And thus the existences of these principles are clearly incorruptible. So what he seems to be saying is that the, the coming and going of the logoi of particulars, uh, species, genera, and higher taxa in evolution does not affect their stability and permanence in God as God's predetermined intentions. Next, the teleological or purposeful logoi. The notion of purpose in evolution is 
very controversial. Most biologists would reject the idea of any overall trajectory in evolution, except perhaps in size and complexity, though many would acknowledge instances of recurring themes, such as camera eyes or intelligence, or constrained roots such as protein folding. Most would also agree that Darwinian natural selection is a passive filtering process lacking in any foresight or any ability to generate just the right genetic variations. In the light of this evolutionary dogma, the logoi as teleological codes might look like the kind of Lamarckian orthogenesis and preformationism that Darwinism was meant to have abolished. Such concerns are, however, unfounded. The exhaustive scope of the logoi's imminence and interrelatedness ensures that they pose no threat to the causal closure of the universe. They are in no competition with the natural world since they constitute the natural world. Indeed, such an immanentist view of God operating within evolution is not new and was an early theological response to Darwinism. For example, the Lux Mundi theologians like Aubrey Moore and J.R. Illingworth. And it exposed as it did the implicit deism lurking in those notions of God as a divine watchmaker. The implication of this is that if the Logoi is in all creatures, and not just in the ideal types and final endpoints, then all individuals and lineages are sanctified and dignified as having value and purpose, no matter how ephemeral, contingent, or transitional. Finally, um, and I need to accelerate a bit, um, the, the good logoi. Now, this is the most difficult challenge to Maximus's logoi doctrine, the problem of evolutionary natural evil the apparent wastefulness, suffering and death caused by natural selection that's been going on for billions of years. And the problem is hard enough for any theological scheme, but particularly hard in the case of the imminent logoi that are working from within evolution. If God was were orchestrating evolution from afar, so to speak, setting in place the general mechanisms and perhaps just nudging it in the right direction, but without determining the detail, then maybe the disvalues of evolution could be put down to accidental byproducts that God allows but does not intend. If, however, God, as the Logos, is working inside evolution from the most generic to the most particular, then it's difficult to see how he cannot be highly implicated in the details. There are various possible responses, and I don't have time to go into them all. Uh, one of them is that uh, the Logos, the Logoi, are even in the apparently bad things, not just the good. And that has an implication that maybe the Logos suffers not just for creation or with creation, but as creation. That's a subject I cover in my thesis, but I'm not going to talk about now. The second option is to say, well, the Logos only, because the Logos is good, he only accounts for the good things in creation, not the bad. The bad must be due to something else. And there are two ways of doing this. One is um, to talk about a variable mode of existence, a tropos hupaxios, which I don't have time to go into now. Another way is to, to think of there being a, a cosmic fall. And an Eastern approach to that is through the famous garments of skin. Now, cosmic fall theodicies are very unfashionable. I can't say I'm a great fan of them myself, and their unpopularity is for three main reasons. First of all, the conflict with evolutionary sequence of events, animal suffering and death predates humankind by millions of years. It risks throwing out the baby with the bathwater because the same mechanism that produces suffering and death also produces much diversity and beauty. It also begs the question why God would allow non-human creatures to suffer as a result of human or angelic sin. And there have been various attempted solutions in Western thinking, young earth creationism, satanic fourth theodicy, backward causation. But an approach that um, is not very well known in, in the West is the idea of the garments of skin, which goes back to many patristic authors, but in particular Gregory of Nyssa, who made an allegorical interpretation of Genesis 3.21, in which the garments of skin are punitive and pedagogical accretions imposed by God in anticipation of human sin, um, an addition or top up to the underlying evolutionary course of the Logoi. Um, so in other words, the Logoi were always meant to be evolutionary, but 
in anticipation of sin, God added extra concessive elements. Now, how can we um, how can we fit that into Darwinian evolution, which is supposed to be a package deal? Well, I, I would suggest one way is that you could think of um, the um, the good parts of Darwinism being selection, being um, sorry, the good parts being variation, and adaptation, and cooperation, but the bad parts being selection and competition and violent death. So maybe. Um, in a world unconstrained by resources or availability of environment, environmental niches, all genetic variants would have had the opportunity to adapt and flourish. I know it's highly speculative. I just want to put it out there as an option that you won't find in many of the textbooks that have been written over the last few years about animal suffering theodicy. I want to hastily move on to the application since I'm running out of time. So the application is the, um, the area of design inferences, the ever present temptation in theology to make more of the law-like and ordered in nature over the contingent and disordered. And there've been, over the last few decades, uh, a lot of doubt has been cast on the neo-Darwinian dogma that evolution is necessarily blind, haphazard and contingent. So you have, you know, Simon Conway Morris and evolutionary convergence, you have Stuart Kaufman, self-assembly and constraint. And then you have the proponents of the extended evolutionary synthesis who um, are talking about behavioral led genetic change like the Baldwin effect, niche construction, epigenetics. In, um, well, some recent theologians have appropriated these findings to suggest that they are more consistent or fitting with an ultimate purpose to the universe. Some like Christopher Southgate in that quote in the book that I mentioned and um, Rope Koyanen have made reference to Maximus's Logoi specifically to um, bolster their argument. And I think that's a mistake. This implies that the, the divergent, contingent and transitional in evolution are somehow less Logoi endowed and less theophanic. And I'm thinking here of the adaptive radiations of the, of the beetles. JBS Haldane said God had an inordinate fondness for beetles, mm -hmm. the largest family of animals on earth. Um, then you have the evolutionary dead ends and transitional intermediates, and you have non-reproducing individual progeny variants that never made it. Maximus, Maximus's evolutionary cosmology suggests a better approach. All good things are logos endowed, even the contingent, the particular, the ephemeral, the transitional, and the one-off. God is not orchestrating evolution from afar. He is living it out as a person, the logos in all things. Lack of order, constraint, or law-like behavior does not mean lack of goodness, but points to divine freedom. And this avoids a God of the gaps mentality, whereby only some things are indicators of design and point to God. I suggest that based on the fact that creation is logoi imbued, we must derive our standard of what designed means by looking at what nature actually comprises rather than at how we humans would go about designing things. This replaces an apologetic design inference that is based on selective use of natural phenomena with one that affirms the presence of God in all that is good, whether law-like or random, universal or particular, temporary or enduring, transitional or complete. So in conclusion, Maximus's Logoi cosmology, I think does indeed resemble biological evolution, though it goes far beyond it. A panentheistic interpretation of Logoi acting in all things serves to dignify evolution and all its products. Maximus's Logoi cosmology should not, I think, be used in support of selective divine design inferences and finally, the Eastern tradition and patristics in general has much to offer science-engaged theology. So I'd finally like to thank my PhD supervisors, Michael Bedette, Connor Cunningham, uh, Elizabeth Theokratov, uh, who kindly introduced me to lots of Eastern Orthodox scholars, the Faraday Institute, for whom I had the privilege of working, who encouraged me to <laughs> take early retirement <laughs> and stop being a fundraiser. I wasn't very successful at 
Um, and to my dear wife, Roz, for funding all of the tuition fees. <clears throat> so thank you very much. Um, maybe we can start in the room. Does anyone have a question for Andrew? Yeah, please. Um, so I think you've already hinted at the answer to this, but just to bring out some ideas in your um, talk, supposing you look at an extinct um, family like um, the Trilobites, what's happening to their logoi? Or do they have logoi? I'm... Yes, thank you. Well, I would say that all things have logoi. Yes. And even extinct individuals, not, not, nothing that even made it to a clade, nothing that actually became um, a famous taxon like the Trilobites, um, everything is logoi endowed because if it didn't, it would cease to exist. If it was everything that exists is good. And lack of goodness means lack of existence, according to Greek metaphysics. So yeah, um, and they've also existed in God's mind, in, in God's intentions eternally as well. But of course, we're not talking about divine idealism here. Things are not, we're not just living in a kind of Cartesian theater of God's mind, we are distinct from God. We occupy a different mode of existence outside of God. Okay, we have a question. I'll just go to a question from online, um, which is a very practical application kind of question. Um, please, can you give your thoughts on how this thinking might impact in it in any way how evolution is taught in the school curriculum how evolution is taught in the school curriculum well um if you were to combine it with re lessons or have any kind of overlap with re lessons you might want to say that um one christian tradition takes seriously the importance of all stages of evolution uh, and to disabuse people of even a hint that we occupy a privileged position because we're at the apex of the tree of life. Every stage in the tree of life, the branches, the twigs, the things that the cul-de-sacs that never made it, they're all uh, good, they're all cherished by God. And of course that then leads to other applications which I haven't had time to talk about like environmental concern um you know if everything is theophanic is everything if everything is logoi in, imbued then it makes our responsibilities even greater okay coming back into the uh, into the room um yeah thank you this is just absolutely brilliant and i think one of the really lovely things as you I was listening is just this anti-utilitarian philosophical ontology behind what you're saying as well. Um, I want to ask about uh, just the doctrine of sin. How does sin interact with the, the Logoi idea? Um, where do you place it in that sense of origin? Because um, obviously there's the, the different four theodicies, but how, what, how, what do we do with sin basically? How, do, how is the world panentheistic but still deeply fallen what what interaction happens between the logoi and, and and sin right excellent question thank you well in the case of human beings who as far as we know are the only beings capable of sin as far as we know and angels of course um the answer is quite straightforward in maximus because rational beings have the unique capacity to change their mode of existence their tropos away from their logos and so part of the, the struggle of life is to ensure that your tropos your mode of being is in line for deification okay and a misalignment means effectively a going towards ceasing to exist but that's only applied so but what is that well i haven't read enough about maximus's hermetiology to know whether he considers it a you know, a, a, a kind of aporia that's 
not possible to understand whether he would say it's, it's a kind of um, privation, I don't know. But all I do know is that the unique case of human beings is that they do have a freedom. They have a freedom to sin, a freedom to move away from their endowed logos. Whereas non-human creation, as my reading of Maximus, is that it has a mode of existence, but it's a fixed mode of existence. And uh, anyway, I think it may partly answer your question. <laughs> Uh, so uh, we've got lots of questions in the room here just to encourage those who are online if you want to ask a question to put it into the into the Q&A box. Um, yeah, okay, so we've got uh, a number of questions over this side of the room. The gentleman in the brown was the first, I think. Okay, great. That was a splendid presentation. I have, I have so many things I'd like to ask you about. Um, I think the first one I'd want to put is, could you just expand on the Tropos logo? Um, distinction because the way I heard you when uh, and particularly just thinking on your answer to that previous question it seems to me that are you close to collapsing the distinction between the two in non-rational beings um, so if you could just expand a little bit yes. on that that'd be really helpful sure I have a slide I anticipated this question <laughs> uh, it's a bit of a complicated complex slides, so bear with me as I try to explain it. Um, so this is a diagram of a, a static model of Logos ontology, okay? So at the top you have the Godhead, Father, Logos, Spirit, around which are the energies of God, activities of God, which Maximus talks about and is famous within Eastern Orthodoxy. The big block at the bottom is creation. So God is beyond being in his essence, Creation is being. And then you can see I've emanated from the logos, the various logoi, which are like the form, the information content. And they, they are what Maximus calls the logoi of being, logoi tes usias. And I then subdivide that into two things. One is constitutive imminence, which is a univocal bridging of God and creation, which is anathema to participatory metaphysicians, I realize. Um, so that's the intrinsic formal cause, the final cause, and it's what leads to that specific butterfly, Vanessa Atalanta, that red specific particular red admiral, which is univocally related to God's intentions for that individual. But you also have the logoi of being uh, entering into participation because that butterfly has beauty. And so its beauty as a butterfly is participating in God's beauty. So that's analogical, and that's more like an extrinsic formal cause. So it's, it's participating in the archetype. But on the right, we have mode of, the mode of existence, the tropos hypoxios, the finite mode of existence, which is also corresponds to hypostasis. And this is what prevents divine idealism and also prevents pantheism because it's what separate, what makes the logoi of being different from God. Now, ultimately, it's, it's what you might call apophatic alterity. So it's, it's what accounts for the infinite qualitative difference between God and creation, which is what ex nihilo is all about. But I'm saying ex nihilo only corresponds to that mode of existence, not to the, the shared logoi of ideas. So all non-human creation, to answer your question, um, and all, well, all creation has this finite mode of existence. It's different from God. Um, but human beings have the ability to flex that as well through rebellion, whereas non-human beings, my reading of Maximus is that it's... Now, there, there are some Maximus scholars <laughs> who might disagree with me, and it all comes down to text and how you interpret, for example, Ambiguum 42, which talks about the, tro the tropoi of things changing. But Maximus, is, his examples that he gives are all miraculous events like the burning bush of Moses and the, and the Red Sea parting and things like that. He doesn't, anywhere that I can see, talk about non-human beings able to change their tropos. Wonderful, thank you. Um, so we have uh, another question online, which uh, kind of comes back to the question of, of, uh, about sin that was asked a moment ago. But 
If we interpret what is bad in an evolutionary world as resulting from divine freedom in created logoi, how do we avoid the notion that God needed to create the world just as it is? Put differently, was sin and its consequences necessary? Well, the, thank you for that question. Um, two things I would want to say. First of all, the the Eastern view of the Incarnation is that it was not a plan B. The Incarnation was not due to an act of Satan. It was always God's intention to have creation maturing through time and for Christ to be uni united with creation in deification. Okay. Um, what was the first thing I was going to say? The sin... Um, was not caused by the logoi according to the garments of skin uh, interpretation. The garments of skin are punitive concessions due to an anticipation of sin to make life harder, to, to, to draw us back to God, um, to curtail our lifespan so that sin doesn't continue for too long. So the remedial and um, uh, punitive concessions I hope I've answered the question at least partly. Wonderful, thank you. And I think we have time um, well, for one or two more questions in the room. I'm afraid I didn't see who had their hands up first on this side. It was outside my field of vision. Um, yeah. I'm always puzzled when people say that the whole of God is in a finite object because we envisage God as infinite. Can you clarify that, please? I'm not sure I can, but it's a good question. It's, it's somewhat um, paradoxical, isn't it? Um, I'm sure that Maximus would agree that God is transcendent as well as imminent, and that the entirety of God is not in everything, but he is via his energies, right? Which is an Eastern distinction, which um, you know, Western scholasticism rejects on the grounds of God's simplicity. Um, but that's his one, that's one get out clause. Um, so here's, here's another slide that might help. Um, and this goes back to John Zizoulas, the famous Greek scholar who talked, had issued a book called um, Communion and Otherness. And he talks about three sources of communion and otherness. So the communion is the, is the yellow bridging <laughs> between God on the left and creation on the right. So one way is to say that communion is through the divine ideas, but there must be a source of otherness. Otherwise, as you say, God is completely in something. You have pantheism. Well, in the case of creation, it's materiality. In the case of God, it's divine essence. Another way is to say it's divine energies, which are the communion, and it's created essence or divine essence, which are the otherness. And the third way, which John Zizoulas prefers, because his theology is all about personhood, is that it's the divine person that bridges, but natures are totally incommensurable. Wonderful. Okay, well, we are actually at the top of the hour, which means uh, we do unfortunately need to wrap things up. I know there's a few more questions outstanding, both online and, uh, and in the room. But um, Andrew, I really want to thank you so much uh, for your talk and for your insights. Um, I have to say, for me personally, you certainly, I said at the beginning, this isn't my field, but you've really whetted my appetite um, to look into learning about some of these ideas further. Really, really interesting. Um, and um, so thank you so much. Should we just give her another round of applause? <laughs>